the 20th century computer industry was just beginning when one man had a big idea. That man was Bill Gates and his big idea was Microsoft Windows. By the 1980s, the computer industry had grown up in just a few years and was in need of a new user-friendly face. The big idea was to reinvent the human interface, the bits that you look at and touch. Bill Gates, the ultimate baby boomer and programming geek, took up the challenge. Gates rode the wave of the new information technology tide. He started small with basic programming and grew his company Microsoft with products such as MS-DOS and Windows 95. Within a year or two of the release of Windows 95, it was an unqualified success and had become the most successful operating system ever produced, driving some competitors out of business. When Internet Explorer was packaged with Windows 95 Plus, Microsoft products were leaving the shelves in droves and entering private homes. Now building upon the successes of earlier Windows products, Gates sees the future of the big idea as one of communication between all technology platforms. He sees the trend will be to have information where you want, to have websites that are richer and allow ease of use for business and consumer activity. Driven by the demands of the user, the full screen PC will become better and better and more able to cope with the customization required so that people get exactly what they want. People are underestimating where the PC can go. Bill Gates considers that we are now entering the second digital decade and the ultimate changes will be in how we watch TV, read or educate our children. TV is going to be very different. Cross-platform dialogue between autos, phones, television, the internet, games and PDAs are a necessary part of the future. When we talk about services, we mean a huge variety of things and things yet to be invented. The mapping services, the payment services, the uh, friends lists and storage that you can have uh, in a very effective way. In a natural extension of his big idea, Gates has demonstrated a coffee table shaped surface computer. So here I've got a table, uh, we call it Microsoft Surface, and when I put my fingers on, there's a camera that recognizes where I'm touching. In fact, I can touch at different places from any outside of the table. Here, the mouse and keyboard are replaced by a more natural interaction of voice, pen and touch. You know, we used to say a, a computer on every desktop and now uh, we say that every desktop will be a computer. Mounted under a plastic tabletop, the 30-inch display screen can be used to order from a virtual menu finger paint, share digital photos, or get information on everyday objects. This simple video recognition opens up a whole new world, and so this is a key part of why computing won't look the same five years from now as it looks today. Connected entertainment experiences will be at the forefront, enabling people to get their video, their music, their gaming on any device and any place you desire. Online distribution of movies and television is going to be the norm in the future. With DVR or digital video record technology and download capabilities being built into all devices that we will communicate with, the Gates Big Idea is set to revolutionise the personal player device. With capabilities like subscriptions and Wi-Fi, the recently released Zoom from Windows is set to offer a clear alternative to other more basic MP3 players. Take this big idea on the road with products like Sync, a fully integrated device that provides not only multitasking, but also a safer, hands-on-the-wheel, eyes-on-the-road experience. The Zoom plugs in easily and synchronises to the car, enabling your multimedia to be loaded almost instantly. So now, no more fumbling for that favourite MP3 or podcast while you're cruising down the information highway. With voice-activated search devices now online, this makes for a safer and far more convenient way to access multimedia while driving. Integrated with a GPS-enabled phone, search and find functions will keep you in contact with what you need and when you need it. Searching for a local business, a service or even movie times will be far easier. The integrated GPS will help the system find what you need right where you are. With over 2 billion voice searches already since launch, it's proven that this is a big idea that works from Bill Gates.
A 20th century city owes a lot to a 19th century big idea. Every office light, every telephone conversation, every traffic signal and every auto lamp exist because of one man's foresight and tenacity. During his lifetime, Thomas Alva Edison had more than 1,000 big ideas. Born before the beginning of the American Civil War, Thomas Edison is credited with more US patents than most corporations are. His inventions took us directly out of the steam age and straight into the modern era of technology and mass communication. Edison's big ideas included microphones, sound recording methods, long-lasting electric light bulbs, x-rays and early motion picture cameras. All these are 19th century ideas that Edison invented well before the age of the motor car and most are still in use. Edison's early career started with improvements to the telegraph system with his designs for an automatic repeater. The quadruplex telegraph could send four simultaneous telegraph signals over the same wire. The first big Edison idea that attracted world notoriety came in 1877, when he recorded his voice onto a crude foil cylinder. A simple nursery rhyme became the first sounds ever reproduced mechanically. So amazed were the 19th century public with this apparently magical achievement that Edison was soon referred to as the wizard. Edison had stumbled upon something that was to usher in a new world of entertainment. His initial attempts to record a voice were part of his efforts to play back recorded telegraph messages and to automate speech sounds for transmission by telephone. Realising the enormity of what he chanced upon, he focused further on his big idea and improved his simple invention. On November the 21st, 1877, he announced the first phonograph, a device for recording and replaying sound. The beginnings of a big idea that would grow into the massive communications market that we know today. Whenever we use a mobile phone or the internet for a chat, we owe a debt of gratitude to Thomas Edison. Edison's simple 1878 design for a carbon microphone became the standard for voice reproduction for many years. Never one to rest on his laurels, Edison and his lab team took the electric light globe and turned it into the long-lasting source of light that we know today. Earlier attempts to make globes last more than a few hours had failed. Edison's filament and vacuum system proved to last many hours, enabling electric lighting to become a household affair. A spectacular display of long-lasting halogen lamps with tungsten filaments is possible due to the Edison big idea. The filaments are sealed into globes, filled with an inert gas, producing a more efficient and brighter source of light than a standard globe. As the need to conserve energy and reduce greenhouse gases is now the quest for manufacturers of lighting, the compact fluorescent lamp, or CFL, has taken the Edison idea further. CFLs radiate a different light spectrum from that of incandescent lamps. Improved phosphor formulations have improved the subjective colour of the light emitted by CFLs. The way doctors are able to treat patients was changed forever when another Edison big idea produced the first commercially available fluoroscope, the machine that takes radiographs or x-rays. The Edison fluoroscope became the standard for medical x-ray examinations. The fundamental design of Edison's fluoroscope is still in use today, despite the fact that Edison himself abandoned the project after nearly losing his own eyesight and seriously maiming his assistant Clarence Daly. Daly had made himself an enthusiastic human guinea pig for the fluoroscopy project and in the process had been exposed to a poisonous dose of radiation. He later died of injuries related to the exposure. In 1903, a shaken Edison said, don't talk to me about x-rays, I'm afraid of them. Edison's early work on the electromechanical design of the motion picture camera helped transform the art from peephole viewers to the massive movie industry that we know today. Thomas Edison, the one-time paperboy who was born in the age of horse-drawn travel, took his big ideas and invented microphones, sound recording, light bulbs, x-rays and early motion picture cameras. He proved that one man with a big idea could change the world.
When French science fiction writer Jules Verne had a big idea, he was 50 years ahead of his time. Some might have thought he was crazy, most just enjoyed the novelist's new science fiction genre. In 1870, Verne wrote his novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and predicted in it that people would travel underwater in the 20th century. By the early 1900s, his big idea had become a fact, and the submarine was born. A submarine is a boat that can be operated underwater. Although experimental submarines had been built before, submarine design took off in the 19th century. Submarines were first widely used in World War I and feature in many large navies. In September 1927, the British Navy proudly showed off what they termed the world's largest submarine, HMS Oberon. The Oberon was the first underwater battleship and was capable of carrying 54 sailors. It was armed with eight 21-inch torpedo tubes and cruised on the surface at 13 knots and when submerged, her speed was seven knots. Fast forward 60 years and nuclear power became the big idea in submarines. With nuclear power, HMS Valiant had an almost unlimited range when submerged and was equipped with powerful underwater radar. The vessel, with a crew of 95, was capable of submersing for months on end. In 1967, Valiant set a record of sailing 12,000 miles submerged in 28 days from Singapore to the UK. Furthering the big idea of underwater travel, the German Navy recently launched a new class of submarine. The U-31 can stay underwater undetected for much longer periods than previous submarines. The U-boat uses an air-independent propulsion system which uses a fuel cell to create oxygen and hydrogen from water. The oxygen produced enables the submarine to run for days or even weeks without snorkelling, which vastly increases its efficiency. 30 years after the James Bond movie, The Spy Who Loved Me, hit the silver screen, Swiss concept car maker, Rinspeed, came up with a big idea to make the scuba. In the 1977 film, Bond's submersible car was an elaborate studio effect, so Rinspeed boss and Bond fan, Frank Ringdenecht set out to make the world's first real submersible car, and the movie fake became a reality. Powered by hydrojets from rechargeable lithium-ion batteries, the scuba is capable of operating at up to a depth of 10 metres and is also certified as a zero-emission car. When it comes to air forces and the requirement for sea-based operations, another Frenchman, inventor Clement Adur, had a big idea in 1909. When he published a description of a ship to operate airplanes at sea, with a flat flight deck and an island superstructure, deck elevators and a hangar bay, landing planes on ships at sea became a reality. Today, the crew of USS Enterprise, the world's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, enjoys state-of-the-art operations, as well as a gym, library and computer room. With a length of 1,092 feet, she is also the only aircraft carrier to house more than two nuclear reactors. And this big idea was estimated to cost in excess of $4.5 billion. Modern aircraft carriers are basically runways at sea and have flat top decks for takeoff and landing. Getting planes off the deck and into the air required more big ideas. Carriers need to cruise up to 35 knots into the wind during takeoff in order to increase the lifting wind speed, or in some cases, catapults are used. When landing, conventional aircraft rely on a tail hook that catches on arrestor wires stretched across the deck to bring them to a stop in shorter distance than normal. Other aircraft, helicopters and VSTOL, or jump jets, can use their hover capabilities to land vertically and so require no assistance in speed reduction upon landing. While the Enterprise can carry up to 66 aircraft, and with more than 5,000 sailors to feed, the kitchen staff is busy preparing meals three times a day. The menu on board the carrier comprises of familiar dishes, and the cooks make sure that variety is never lacking. While much attention is given to ensuring that the crews are well taken care of on board the ship, some say being at sea is never too comfortable. From science fiction to science fact, the big ideas of submarines and aircraft carriers are here to stay.
In the early years of the 20th century, one man had a big idea. Scottish inventor and engineer John Logie Baird combined the success of photography, cinema and the transmission of electric power to create a new media that would change the globe forever. His big idea was to transmit moving pictures through the air, an idea that is commonplace today, but in Baird's day, the idea was considered downright outlandish, if not impossible. On October the 2nd, 1925, Baird proved his naysayers wrong. He took an old hat box, a pair of scissors, some darning needles, and a lens from a bicycle light. Baird combined these makeshift items with an old tea chest, some Scottish ingenuity, and a great deal of sealing wax and glue and created his big idea, the first working television set. The fuzzy transmission was of the unlikely head of a ventriloquist dummy. The quality was poor, with only five frames per second and 30 lines of vertical resolution, at least 150 times less definition than a HD image of today. Shortly later, Baird coerced his colleague, 20-year-old William Tainton, to get in front of the box camera to see what a human face would look like, and Tainton became the first person to ever be televised. It was the world's first demonstration of a true television system, one that could broadcast live moving images with tonal graduation. In 1927, Baird transmitted a long-distance television signal over 438 miles of telephone line between London and Glasgow. Television broadcasting began in November 1936 using an electronic system that lasted until 1964. Today we, have, we are able to show television on screens large enough to be shown to a cinema audience and have recently been able to send wireless television pictures in colour. Since those early days, the use of television as a means of communication has expanded rapidly. Live broadcast in colour can now be transmitted using satellites around the world. In 1936, though, the distance for this demonstration broadcast was small, just across London to an exhibition. TV now spans the globe and is the world's most popular form of entertainment, offering multiple channels covering all sorts of subjects, though it has been suggested that Baird might not have altogether approved. Baird's big idea has come a long way. The low definition images of the 30s has progressed to the high definition images of today. The television set has transformed from small cathode ray tubes to massive screens less than an inch thick. At a high tech expo in Japan, an ultra thin flat TV recently went on show. The world's first television based on organic light emitting diodes or OLED technology. OLED panels are energy efficient and make thin and light displays. They offer crisp pictures and have a strength in showing fast-moving images, suitable for watching sports events and action movies. Sony, the world's number two LCD TV maker behind Samsung, expects the 11-inch OLED TV with a thickness of 3 mm to sell for 200,000 yen, or $1,700. Because now it's thinner, lighter, better performance, it's going to let you put it in a whole, whole different set of environments where TV displays probably haven't been in the past. While Sony goes thin, rival Panasonic maker Matsushitsa is going big. At the same expo, Panasonic unveiled the world's largest 103-inch plasma TV monitor. The price tag was nearly as big as the screen, at 6 million yen, or 52,000 US dollars. A Japanese research institute has furthered Baird's big idea by unveiling the first real 3D images and the future of holographic television. The National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology invented the device displaying real 3D images, which consist of dot arrays in space where there is nothing but air. Although 3D displays might have existed in the past, researchers say that most 3D displays are made up of pseudo 3D images on 2D planes, viewed by using the human binocular disparity. This disparity has been inducing physiological discomfort in long-term users, viewing these vertical images according to experts. From 3D images to large screens and mobile TV, viewed comfortably in the palm of your hand where and when you like, John Logie Baird's big idea of transmitting television images has proved to be the number one form of entertainment worldwide.
In the world of Formula One, big ideas are commonplace. With Bernie Eccleston at the helm, Formula One is constantly striving for better racetracks and races. The ING Race Index has taken the big idea of racetrack design to a new level. The Race Index compares all Formula One circuits from constantly updated information and statistics. Analyzing the strain on drivers, the engineering requirements, the circuit and vehicle setup. The Race Index shows at a glance the challenges that each course presents. Herman Tilke, a former racing driver, had another big idea for racetrack design. His big idea was to get out from behind the wheel and to become the world's leading race circuit designer. It's every young motor racing fan's dream to drive a Formula One race car. And for McLaren Mercedes drivers, Fernando Alonso and Lewis Hamilton, that dream extends beyond the cockpit of a 200 mile per hour racing machine. Tilka Engineering was formed in 1984, utilising his skills in architecture, civil engineering and electronic engineering. Combining those skills with his knowledge as a motor racing driver has seen the German mastermind the latest series of circuits specifically designed to host Formula One. To be involved in Formula One, it was uh, only in my bag of my head, but I wanted to design something on racetracks. And this was my aim. But to design a brand new racetrack, it was only a dream. I didn't think that it, that it could happen. But it's not all about track design. An emphasis is also put on the design of the structures that hold the fans, the teams and the world media. And it's Tilka's ability to capture traditional elements and incorporate them into his circuit designs that has kept him ahead of his contemporaries. One example is the paddock area at the Shanghai International Circuit, which is modelled on the 400-year-old Yew Garden. When we start a new circuit, uh, we have a clear sheet of paper and we start with fresh ideas. We learn from every circuit and it's step by step is the result a little bit better. The balance between Formula One driver, track safety and spectator is not so easy to work out. The Formula One driver normally want to have very quick corners. So we have to bring design features inside uh, which create action. And this is not easy to bring everything together. With four circuits on the F1 calendar already bearing the Tilka name, Bahrain, Shanghai, Istanbul and Sepang, and another two to be added in the coming years, Abu Dhabi and South Korea, there is no doubt that Herman Tilke is having a big impact on Formula One and his passion for the sport remains stronger than ever. When we designed Bahrain, we looked to the environment and uh, we tried to show where we are and we tried to show that we are inside the desert. We had a slope and we used this slope for, for the track so we have a lot of ups and downs there. When we start uh, designing the architecture, we use the traditional elements to, to show that we here are in Bahrain, here are in China and here are in Turkey. In the design process, we uh, talk to drivers, uh, not only actual drivers, also to former drivers, and uh, they have their influence in the design. We have a, a GPDA association of drivers that uh, we improve safety and uh, if we see something in a circuit that we think that is dangerous, maybe we, we report that to the FIA and, and they have a thing. But the new tracks are more safe and I think maybe the old circuits are a little bit more fun to drive with a little bit more dangerous I mean. But uh, you know, I think uh, the combination of old tracks and new tracks like we have now in, in Formula One is good for us. Herman Tilke's big idea for racetrack design is creating a new and improved experience for Formula One fans and drivers. When I see the first time the Formula One cars uh, driving on our design circuit, uh, then I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm very proud.
Although helicopters were developed and built during the first half century of flight, some even reaching limited production, it was not until 1942 that a helicopter designer realised his big idea. Igor Sikorsky's big idea had been with him for over 30 years. In fact, he had experimented with helicopter-type machines not long after he first saw a newspaper picture of Orville Wright and his pioneering airplane. Within 24 hours of seeing that 1908 picture, Sikorsky had decided to change his life's work and study aviation. 35 years later, Sikorsky's big idea took to the skies and the event of the helicopter age had begun. Although only rising a metre on the first test flight, this skeleton of tubes and canvas was to become the forerunner of the first successful production helicopter, the Sikorsky R4. After experimenting with configurations to counteract the torque produced by the single main rotor, Sikorsky settled on a single, smaller rotor mounted vertically on the tail boom. In all, Sikorsky would produce over 400 helicopters before the end of World War II. Helicopters were soon acknowledged as excellent workhorses in remote areas and for operating in rough terrain. Igor Sikorsky took great satisfaction from seeing his big idea being used to save lives. During his 60-year career in aviation, he accomplished many aviation firsts. However, nothing he accomplished in those 60 years equaled his pride in the use of the helicopter for air rescue operations. Sikorsky once said, if a man is in need of rescue, an airplane can come in and throw flowers on him, and that's just about all. But a direct lift aircraft could come in and save his life. This was proven when helicopters were put into service. United States Coast Guard Commander Frank Erickson flew the R-4 on the first helicopter mercy mission in January 1944. He delivered blood plasma for injured sailors after an explosion occurred aboard a US Navy destroyer off New York Harbor. Due to its ability to take off and land vertically and to hover for extended periods of time, Sikorsky's big idea became the aircraft of choice for operations that were far too difficult for fixed wing flight. The availability of lightweight turbo shaft engines led to the development of larger, faster and higher performance helicopters. Today, helicopters are used for transportation, for construction, for firefighting, search and rescue and a variety of other jobs that require its special capabilities. The Sikorsky S64 Skycrane, introduced in the 1960s, is capable of carrying 10 tonne loads. The Skycrane is used for all sorts of lifting, like placing radio transmission towers in remote locations and large air conditioning units in the tops of tall buildings. The Skycrane was put to good use in 1971 when it was loaned from the US Army to help rebuild dikes that were designed to prevent another tragedy like the 1950 flood in which nearly 2,000 people died. The Sikorsky Skycrane was principally involved in carrying heavy blocks of concrete to fill the last major gap in the dike system. The Black Hawk is the military version of Sikorsky's big idea. The Black Hawk is in the armed forces service of 20 nations worldwide as a medium lift utility or assault helicopter. Based on the twin turbo shaft engine, single rotored Sikorsky S-70, the Black Hawk series of aircraft can perform a wide array of missions, including the tactical transport of troops, electronic warfare and aeromedical evacuation. In air assault operations, it can move a squad of 11 combat troops with equipment or reposition the 105 howitzer and a four-man crew in a single lift. The $5.9 million Black Hawk is equipped with advanced avionics and electronics for increased survivability and capability, such as the global positioning system. Besides military operation, Sikorsky's big idea sees a loss of action while on peacetime missions. Transfers to remote oil rigs are made safer and more comfortable. High-flying business owners can skip downtown for that lunchtime meeting and television news crews can report the latest, while the police air wing serves and protects the citizens. All this is possible because of one man's big idea, the helicopter, the big idea of Igor Sikorsky.
The need to see in the dark to observe weather patterns from space or conduct security surveillance created the big idea of night vision and thermal imaging. The green vision of military operations in warfare is a common image from the nightly news. Infrared image intensifiers enable night vision devices to literally see in light that is too dark for unassisted vision. Thermal imaging and forward-looking infrared, or FLIR, is a continuation of the night vision big idea. Thermographic cameras detect radiation in the infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum and produce images of that radiation. Since FLIRs use detection of thermal energy to create the picture assembled for the video output, they can be used to help pilots and drivers steer their vehicles at night, in fog, or detect warm objects against a cold background when it's completely dark. The big idea of thermal imaging photography finds many other uses. Originally used by NASA for monitoring weather patterns, it's now used to monitor the heat tiles on space shuttle flights following the tragic flight of 2003. Firefighters can use thermal imaging to see through smoke, find persons and localise the base of a fire. Police have used FLIR devices to locate illegal drug growing activity in the UK. No longer needing to rely on nosy neighbours or reports of huge power usage, the police can now monitor thermal images and detect the heat that is associated with growing drug crops. FLIR cameras can help heating experts to see heat loss from buildings and take steps to reduce greenhouse gas usage. These thermal images show the heat loss from a public building. The white and red areas are where energy is escaping from this building, while the cooler colours, just as green and blue, show good insulation or ceiling. With thermal imaging, power lines maintenance technicians locate overheating joints and parts, a telltale sign of their failure to eliminate potential hazards. Some physiological activities, particularly responses, in human beings and other warm-blooded animals can also be monitored with thermographic imaging. Scientists have discovered a new means of detecting when a person is telling a lie, which could revolutionise the security industry. Scientists have developed an instant lie detector technique which picks up mini hot flushes around the eyes and could lead to truth tests becoming standard at airport check-ins. In new tests developed by scientists at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, a high-definition thermal imaging camera scans a person's face to see if they blush when answering a question. In theory, blood should rush to the eye area of liars, researcher James Levine said, while the innocent remain coolly and calmly unaffected. Experiments, in which 20 people were randomly asked to stab a mannequin, rob it of $20 and then profess their innocence, showed the technique to be as effective as the existing lie detector or polygraph tests. The thermal camera correctly picked out 75% of the guilty individuals and 90% of the innocents, a control group who had no knowledge of the mock crime. Furthering the big idea of thermal imaging security devices, an Israeli company has created what they are calling a virtual fence. The picture of an unknown face fills the screen of the FLIR camera that can be used to beef up security in public events. The FLIR camera is so sensitive that it can pick up the heat signature left from the person's finger on their face. We can detect uh, boats in the water. For land applications we can detect human and, and uh, vehicle uh, intruders uh, within a defined uh, perimeter. And for uh, aerial applications uh, we can detect uh, intruding aircraft. The thermal imaging cameras are the 21st century equivalent of the guard on foot. From control booths, security officials will be able to scan wide areas. What makes them special is that they'll be able to detect any movement from intruders, zoom in on it and analyse the picture, day or night. Thermal imaging and forward-looking infrared devices are truly big ideas from the scientific world.
During World War II, a British engineering scientist had a big idea. The big idea was to bomb the Mona Nida dams in West Germany, causing a loss of water supply to German industry. The scientist was Sir Barnes Wallace, and his big idea was to drop bouncing bombs from low-flying aircraft and skip them into the dam walls. Wallace's career in engineering spanned 58 years, most of them spent designing aircraft. Most of his pre-war career was at Vickers, where he had many big ideas. Among them, the first use of geodetic design in engineering, in the gas bag wiring of the R100, which at that time was the largest airship ever designed. He also pioneered the use of light alloy in production engineering in the structured design of the R100. During wartime service, Barnes Wallace had a big idea for an attack on a battleship with a spherical bomb or surface torpedo. By bouncing a weapon on the surface of the water, striking the ship and then dropping to explode at a depth where the hull is less protected. The initial spherical design with dimples codenamed Highball was developed to be dropped from a modified de Havilland Mosquito that could carry two of the bombs. But it was the proposed Operation Chastise, or the Dam Busters Raid, that draw all the attention. His initial idea was for a 10-tonne bomb to be dropped from 40,000 feet. This was part of the earthquake bomb concept. However, at the time there were no aircraft capable of flying at this height with such a heavy load. A much smaller charge would suffice if it could be exploded directly against the dam wall below the surface of the water. When defence chiefs just would not believe that he could make bombs bounce on water until they hit the dam wall, Wallace was to prove that his big idea could make it happen. Checking his calculations with one of the first advanced computing devices to be used operationally, the Mechanical Differential Analyzer, an early analogue computer designed to solve differential equations by integration. The result was quite simple. As the drum-shaped bombs left the plane, they were given rapid backward spin. The bombs, when dropped at low altitude at the right speed, were spun backwards at up to 500 RPM and would skip over the surface of the water in a series of bounces before reaching the dam wall and then, using residual spin, drop down the dam wall to the base. An accurate drop could bypass the dam protection and let the bomb be detonated against the dam with a hydrostatic fuse. The first raid was started on the night of the 16th of May, 1943. 19 Lancasters took off from Scampton on that raid, which caused havoc to German industries along the Ruhr Valley. With the war over, Wallace continued with big ideas aplenty. In the 1950s, Wallace developed an experimental rocket-propelled torpedo, codenamed Heyday. It was powered by compressed air and hydrogen peroxide. Although the idea was sold to the US, the original designs of the swing-wing bomber were largely his. The wings of the TFX bomber were designed to move forward for slow speed flying and backwards for supersonic flight. Some experts had expressed doubts as to whether this principle would work in practice, but test flights proved that Barnes Wallace's big idea actually worked. Wallace had also demonstrated various concepts of the swing-wing by flying scale models without tailplanes. The proof of the Wallace big idea finally came to fruition with the introduction of the F-111 in the 1960s, which had swing wings based on Wallace's big idea. The F-111 was the first production variable geometry or swing wing aircraft, seeing service with the US Air Force from 67 through to 1998. The Royal Australian Air Force is the only air force to operate the F-111 currently and will be until 2010, when the big idea of Barnes Wallace will be replaced by the F-18 Super Hornets. At the end of his career, when he was well into his 80s, Sir Barnes Wallace was still coming up with big ideas. He designed a replacement for the Concorde, which he proposed would fly at supersonic speed across the globe from London to Sydney, with no stops and at sufficient altitude to reduce sonic boom. Barnes Wallace, engineer, designer and scientist, will be remembered as a man with big ideas.
during World War II, the search for faster and more powerful aircraft was ever increasing. When Air Commodore Sir Frank Whittle had a big idea for a jet engine, he started a revolution in aircraft engineering. In his lifetime, Sir Frank was to see the jet engine industry grow into a multi-million pound business, from an invention that he could not afford to patent because he needed the money for a medical bill. With the introduction of the jet engine, intercontinental flights became more practical, safer and faster. The jet engine that Sir Frank saw in his big idea has progressed at supersonic speed to become the high-tech, fuel-efficient power plants of the future. Today, Rolls-Royce Trent 900 engines power the Airbus A380. At takeoff, the A380's four engines are delivering thrust equivalent to the power of more than 3,500 family cars. Each of the 70 high-pressure turbine blades produces about 900 horsepower, more power than a Formula One racing car. If you applied the high-pressure turbine blade cooling technology to an ice cube, you could put it in an oven at 200 degrees centigrade and it would never melt. The 116-inch fan operates at nearly 3,000 RPM, which means that the blade tips are travelling at about 1,000 miles per hour or about 1.3 times the speed of sound. When it comes to military hardware, the Whittle's big idea is taking technology to the limit. A fully fused and integrated data flow, processed by all digital systems, gives the Saab Gripen the power, intelligence and agility to fight the information war for the pilot as well as the commander to the maximum operational effect. The 414 engine is capable of producing more than 22,000 pounds of thrust. In a recent £1 billion contract, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has purchased Eurofighter Typhoon aircraft powered by twin EJ-200 jet engines. The EJ-200-powered Eurofighter Typhoon began operation with the air forces of Germany, Italy, Spain and the United Kingdom in 2003. The total EJ-200 fleet has accumulated more than 50,000 engine flying hours and to date approximately 125 EJ-200 engines have been delivered for the UK RAF. Back over at Rolls-Royce, the Whittle's big idea has taken a new turn with the development of specialised engines for the Short Takeoff Vertical Landing Aircraft or STO-VL. Experience is drawn from the bank of knowledge accumulated in developing and producing the Pegasus the power plant for the unique Harrier jump jet. The turbofan has four rotating nozzles, two on each side, that allows bypass air and exhaust gases to be vectored downwards. It also incorporates contra-rotating engine spools to minimise gyroscopic effect on hovering stability. The Osprey is powered by two Rolls-Royce Allison turboshaft engines. The CV-22 takes off vertically and once airborne, the nacelle engine and prop rotor group on each wing and can rotate into a forward position. With more than 6,200 shaft horsepower per engine and can cruise at 241 knots. Powering corporate and regional aircraft like the Cessna Citation, the Rolls-Royce AE3007 turbofan is designed to meet the stringent requirements of this type of operation. A rugged, wide cord fan with solid titanium blades provides excellent protection from foreign object damage. The engine is designed to pass ingested debris away from the core and into the bypass duct where it connects it harmlessly. An efficient three-stage low-pressure turbine drives the fan, which has a 5.1 bypass ratio. This results in low acoustic signature levels, fuel efficiency and excellent performance. The hollow, titanium wide cord fan blade, pioneered by Rolls-Royce and introduced into airline service in the 1980s, set new standards in aerodynamic efficiency and resistance to foreign object damage. Designed specifically for high bypass turbofans, the breadth of these blades sets them apart from the narrow and less efficient equivalents of earlier times. As the world of jet aircraft travel powers into the future, a future that would not be possible without the legacy of Sir Frank Whittle's big idea.
100 years ago, two brothers had a big idea and they changed the path of human history forever. Their big idea was to overcome the power of gravity and the timeless dream of flying was realised. For Orville and Wilbur Wright, two bicycle repairmen from Ohio, USA, that first flight lasted only 12 seconds and travelled a mere 120 feet or 36 metres, but it was clearly flight. 100 years later, the big idea has moved from the Wright brothers' shaky first flights to the world's biggest passenger airliner, the A380. It can carry up to 840 travellers. Everything about this plane is big. It has a wingspan of 261 feet, it's 240 feet long, and it's 80 feet high. This aircraft was developed and assembled into Luce, France, as part of the European Airbus Consortium. Components came from four European countries, Germany, France, Spain and Britain. The British manufacturer Rolls-Royce supplies the Trent 900 jet engines for the A380 and its wings are made in Wales. Probably the aircraft's most dominant feature is the upper deck, which runs along the complete length of the plane. Different airlines have different ideas on what this area will be used for and most have opted for more business class seats. But some plans also include shops, gyms, libraries, bars and entertainment centres. The aircraft manufacturers hope that the spacious interiors of the double-decker jet will entice potential US buyers to place orders. The Lufthansa A380 has room for 549 passengers in first, business and economy class, with 23 cabin crew and 5 flight crew. An eight-hour flight to New York from Frankfurt, Germany, was a chance for the plane's builder Airbus and German airline Lufthansa AG to show off the jewel of Airbus's offerings to potential American buyers and to the airports they hoped to turn into flight bases for the jet. The passengers and crew were also enthusiastic about the plane's interior. The 239-foot-long A380 can burn a gallon of gas per passenger every 80 miles and fly some 8,000 nautical miles. Lufthansa chief pilot Jürgen Raps, who has flown the A380 before, said that despite the super jumbo size, it was nimble and responsive, like a Formula One car. Airbus hopes the A380, designed to carry more people farther than any plane in history at subsonic speeds, will dominate air travel for the next two decades. Recently, US aviation giant Boeing rolled out their 787 at the Everett Assembly Factory. It had already become the fastest selling wide body airliner in history, with nearly 600 orders. The $200 million Boeing 787 Dreamliner is a mid-sized, wide body, twin engine jet airliner. It will carry between 210 and 330 passengers, depending on variant and seating configuration. Boeing stated that it will be more fuel efficient than earlier Boeing airliners and will be the first major airliner to use composite materials for most of its construction. Boeing's development of the 787 is also innovative in the collaborative management approach with suppliers. On January the 28, 2005, the aircraft's development designation 7E7 was changed to the 787. Early release concept images depicted a radical design with highly curved surfaces. On April the 26, 2005, a year after the launch of the program, the final look of the external 787 design was frozen, with a less rakish nose and a more conventional tail. Originally scheduled to enter service in May 2008, production has been delayed and it is currently scheduled to enter into service in late 2009. The big idea of air travel has moved on to the point that the next significant steps in development of the aircraft will not be the measures of distance and speed and height, but rather the development of new aircraft materials, which make the plane more efficient, more durable and less consuming of fuels.
Building bridges has long been a big idea and many ancient examples still stand today. Recently, Prague residents celebrated the 650th anniversary of the laying of the first stone of their famous Charles Bridge. Named after its founder, the Czech King and Roman Emperor Charles IV, the Charles Bridge was at the heart of the Roman Empire when it was founded in 1357. For almost 300 years, it was the only bridge to connect Prague across the Voltava River. In 1940, the big idea of bridge design had a serious reality check when the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapsed. The suspension bridge in Washington State, USA, buckled and broke up in high winds. Since then, methods of predicting the impact of wind turbulence on suspension bridges have improved. But there remains an element of guesswork until a bridge is actually completed. Now, a new supercomputer at the University of Nottingham is helping to reduce the element of guesswork. Researchers hope it will help explain the effects that the forces of nature have on man-made structures. The mechanical engineering team at Nottingham University are using 3D computer modelling techniques to assess the danger of wind turbulence. With the new computer we can run faster cases. Uh, we can run cases where we have ca calculate far more eddies and, and far more detail of the, the forces within it. But the other thing we can do, do is we can look at many different uh, setups. So you might want to look at a bridge design and say, what happens if we change this parameter? What happens if we change another parameter? And we can change that. We can test many different values of that parameter all at, all at the same time to come up with a detailed understanding of what that design is going to look like. The high-performance computer will allow researchers to perform calculations 100 times faster than is currently possible. This will help engineers develop safer designs for the next generation of suspension bridges. Recently, an agreement was reached in Berlin between the Danish and German authorities to proceed with the construction of the Feynman Belt Bridge. The bridge will run 19 kilometres from a point about 2 kilometres west of Rodby in Denmark to Puttgarden on the island of Feynman, which is already connected by a bridge to the German mainland. Construction is due to start in 2011 and is expected to be completed in 2018. The single track railway line will be electrified by the time work on the bridge is completed. A double track electrified railway line is planned to be made available seven years after the bridge is opening to traffic. The four pillars carrying the bridge will be approximately 280 metres tall. The vertical clearance will be 65 metres, allowing sea traffic to and from the Baltic Sea to go beneath it. The design has tentatively been decided to be a triple span cable stayed bridge with four road lanes and two rail tracks. Costing an estimated 5 billion euro, the bridge will shorten the rail journey from Hamburg to Copenhagen from nearly five hours down to three and a half hours. According to prominent Danish bridge specialist, Professor Niels Gimsing from the University of Technology in Copenhagen, the projected 20 kilometer long FEMA belt link will be among the longest fixed links in Europe and it will be a very special piece of construction. The investigations indicate that uh, the most sensible solution will be a bridge crossing over the entire width of the strait and it will probably be similar to uh, the Öresund bridge. Uh, it means that it will carry both road and railway traffic with the train running on the lower deck and the motorway on, on the upper deck and um, it uh, will be almost two and a half times as, as long as uh, the Öresund bridge because it has to reach from coast to coast. And also uh, it will need to have higher towers. Uh, first of all, there will be four towers and each will be approximately 300 metres high. The aim of the fixed FEMA link is to speed up the integration of Scandinavia and Europe. And uh, we need more and more more direct uh, communication between uh, Copenhagen and Berlin and um, for that purpose we need the bridge. Building bridges through space, whether it's between countries or simply over a local river, will no doubt continue to be a big idea of the future. The Edison was soon referred to as the Wizard, 
Edison had stumbled upon something that was to usher in a new world of entertainment. His initial attempts to record a voice were part of his efforts to play back recorded telegraph messages and to automate speech sounds for transmission by telephone. Realising the enormity of what he chanced upon, he focused further on his big idea and improved his simple invention. On November the 21st, 1877, he announced the first phonograph, a device for recording and replaying sound. The beginnings of a big idea that would grow into the massive communications market that we know today. Whenever we use a mobile phone or the internet for a chat, we owe a debt of gratitude to Thomas Edison. Edison's simple 1878 design for a carbon microphone became the standard for voice reproduction for many years. Never one to rest on his laurels, Edison and his lab team took the electric light globe and turned it into the long-lasting source of light that we know today. Earlier attempts to make globes last more than a few hours had failed. Edison's filament and vacuum system proved to last many hours, enabling electric lighting to become a household affair. A spectacular display of long-lasting halogen lamps with tungsten filaments is possible due to the Edison big idea. The filaments are sealed into globes, filled with an inert gas, producing a more efficient and brighter source of light than a standard globe. As the need to conserve energy and reduce greenhouse gases is now the quest for manufacturers of lighting, the compact fluorescent lamp, or CFL, has taken the Edison idea further. CFLs radiate a different light spectrum from that of incandescent lamps. Improved phosphor formulations have improved the subjective colour of the light emitted by CFLs. The way doctors are able to treat patients was changed forever when another Edison big idea produced the first commercially available fluoroscope, the machine that takes radiographs or x-rays. The Edison fluoroscope became the standard for medical x-ray examinations. The fundamental design of Edison's fluoroscope is still in use today. ...that you can have uh, in a very effective way. In a natural extension of his big idea, Gates has demonstrated a coffee table shaped surface computer. Here I've got a table, uh, we call it Microsoft Surface, and when I put my fingers on, there's a camera that recognizes where I'm touching. In fact, I can touch at different places from any outside of the table. Here, the mouse and keyboard are replaced by a more natural interaction of voice, pen and touch. You know, we used to say a, a computer on every desktop, and now uh, we say that every desktop will be a computer. Mounted under a plastic tabletop, the 30-inch display screen can be used to order from a virtual menu, finger paint, share digital photos, or get information on everyday objects. This simple video recognition opens up a whole new world, and so this is a key part of why computing won't look the same five years from now as it looks today. Connected entertainment experiences will be at the forefront, enabling people to get their video, their music, their gaming on any device and any place you desire. Online distribution of movies and television is going to be the norm in the future. With DVR or digital video record technology and download capabilities being built into all devices that we will communicate with. The Gates Big Idea is set to revolutionise the personal player device. With capabilities like subscriptions and Wi-Fi, the recently released Zoom from Windows is set to offer a clear alternative to other more basic MP3 players. Take this big idea on the road with products like Sync, a fully integrated device that provides not only multitasking, but also a safer, hands on the wheel, eyes on the road experience. The Zoom plugs in easily and synchronises to the car enabling your multimedia to be loaded almost instantly. So now, no more fumbling for that favourite MP3 or podcast while you're cruising down the information highway. With voice-activated search devices now online, this makes for a safer and far more convenient way to access multimedia while driving. Integrated with a GPS-enabled phone, search and find functions will keep you in contact with what you need. The 20th century computer industry was just beginning when one man had a big idea. That man was Bill Gates and his big idea was Microsoft Windows. By the 1980s, the computer industry had grown up in just a few years and was in need of a new user-friendly face. 
The big idea was to reinvent the human interface, the bits that you look at and touch. Bill Gates, the ultimate baby boomer and programming geek, took up the challenge. Gates rode the wave of the new information technology tide. He started small with basic programming and grew his company Microsoft with products such as MS-DOS and Windows 95. Within a year or two of the release of Windows 95, it was an unqualified success and had become the most successful operating system ever produced, driving some competitors out of business. When Internet Explorer was packaged with Windows 95 Plus, Microsoft products were leaving the shelves in droves and entering private homes. And now building upon the successes of earlier Windows products, Gates sees the future of the big idea as one of communication between all technology platforms. He sees the trend will be to have information where you want, to have websites that are richer and allow ease of use for business and consumer activity. Driven by the demands of the user, the full screen PC will become better and better and more able to cope with the customization required so that people get exactly what they want. People are underestimating where the PC can go. Bill Gates considers that we are now entering the second digital decade and the ultimate changes will be in how we watch TV, read or educate our children. TV is going to be very different. Cross-platform dialogue between autos, phones, television, the internet, games and PDAs are a necessary part of the future. When we talk about services, we mean a huge variety of things and things yet to be invented. The mapping services, the payment services, the uh, friends lists and store... ...and when you need it. Searching for a local business, a service or even movie times will be far easier. The integrated GPS will help the system find what you need right where you are. With over 2 billion voice searches already since launch, it's proving that this is a big idea that works from Bill Gates. A 20th century city owes a lot to a 19th century big idea. Every office light, every telephone conversation, every traffic signal and every auto lamp exist because of one man's foresight and tenacity. During his lifetime, Thomas Alva Edison had more than 1,000 big ideas. Born before the beginning of the American Civil War, Thomas Edison is credited with more US patents than most corporations are. His inventions took us directly out of the steam age and straight into the modern era of technology and mass communication. Edison's big ideas included microphones, sound recording methods, long-lasting electric light bulbs, x-rays and early motion picture cameras. All these are 19th century ideas that Edison invented well before the age of the motor car and most are still in use. Edison's early career started with improvements to the telegraph system with his designs for an automatic repeater. The quadruplex telegraph could send four simultaneous telegraph signals over the same wire. The first big Edison idea that attracted world notoriety came in 1877, when he recorded his voice onto a crude foil cylinder. A simple nursery rhyme became the first sounds ever reproduced mechanically. So amazed were the 19th century public with this apparently magical achievement, despite the fact that Edison himself abandoned the project after nearly losing his own eyesight and seriously maiming his assistant Clarence Daly. Daly had made himself an enthusiastic human guinea pig for the fluoroscopy project and in the process had been exposed to a poisonous dose of radiation. He later died of injuries related to the exposure. In 1903, a shaken Edison said, don't talk to me about x-rays, I'm afraid of them. Edison's early work on the electromechanical design of the motion picture camera helped transform the art from peephole viewers to the massive movie industry that we know today. Thomas Edison, the one-time paperboy who was born in the age of horse-drawn travel, took his big ideas and invented microphones, sound recording, light bulbs, x-rays and early motion picture cameras. He proved that one man with a big idea could change the world.
When French science fiction writer Jules Verne had a big idea, he was 50 years ahead of his time. Some might have thought he was crazy, most just enjoyed the novelist's new science fiction genre. In 1870, Verne wrote his novel, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and predicted in it that people would travel underwater in the 20th century. By the early 1900s, his big idea had become a fact, and the submarine was born. A submarine is a boat that can be operated underwater. Although experimental submarines had been built before, submarine design took off in the 19th century. Submarines were first widely used in World War I and featuring many large navies. In September 1927, the British Navy proudly showed off what they